<coughs> now, one way of formulating this is uh, psychodynamic. Mm -hmm. And in, in Fairbairn's uh, formulation, Fairbairn's a child analyst, um, he des described this as the critical abuser or parental imago being an internal sabotage. And this cannot be tolerated in the patient's mental space. And the only way out the patient has is to extrude it, externalize it as a persecutory voice. But as a result, there's a penalty to pay, which is that any control the patient had over the, the abuser, however meager, is lost. And the extruded persecutor becomes autonomous and takes over control of the patient. So the aim of the therapy is to give the patient's ego back its mastery over lost provinces of his mental life. That's not my quote, that's Freud speaking in the last year of his life. So how do we help the patient create the avatar? The system consists of three different components. There is a face matching component, which is a commercial product called FaceGen. It's very similar to the um, police identikit program except that it's uh, technicolor, it's three-dimensional, it can be moved through space, and it looks very realistic. The face is animated through another commercial program, Anasoft Lip Sync, which synchronizes the lip movements with the voice. And that's used very often by cartoonists. The, however, the problem of trying to match the voice that only the patient hears, there was no software for that. So Mark Huckville, who's at the cutting edge, cutting edge of this kind of development, developed a novel real-time morphing technology. And I'll explain that. Um, I was the only therapist in the study. I didn't have enough money to hire another one. <laughs> so my voice that was morphed. And uh, what Mark asked me to do was to read a number of paragraphs. And then each paragraph, which represented a sample of my voice, was morphed in different ways, a higher tone or a gruffer voice, uh, to make a whole variety of voice types. The other thing that, uh, other bit of equipment we used was the MP3 player to record sessions. So matching the face was relatively easy for the patients, but, and this is interesting because it's not in the literature, many patients did not experience a face which was associated with the voice. And those patients were asked to choose a face they would feel comfortable talking to. I'm going to show you some examples of the faces they chose. It took about 15 minutes to create a face. Looking at the top left-hand corner, this is a, an English devil with a red face. Um, going to the right, to the next one, uh, this, according to the patient, is the head of the criminal underworld in London. Below him is a Rastafarian devil, because this patient comes from Ethiopia. And then to the left of that patient is the chief executive of a film company. So on the whole, it took 15 minutes to create the face. It was more difficult to create the voice. Now this is the experimental setup. On the right hand side, you'll see the patient sitting in a room on their own, watching a screen on which they see the avatar, they can hear the avatar, and they can also hear the therapist talking. In another room, some distance away, the therapist sits, sits. And the therapist can hear everything the patient hears and can obviously see the avatar too. The next slide shows what the therapist, sitting in a little cubicle, can see. On the right-hand side is um, an avatar of an angel. And the therapist can see the avatar very clearly. On the left-hand side is another little screen. The green bar on the screen when the therapist clicks on the green bar, he can speak through the avatar with the more voice that the patient chose. When he clicks on the black side, he can speak through, uh, through his own voice, unmorphed, as the therapist. This is an angel. One of the patients in our study heard angels talking to each other. They never addressed him, but he heard them in conversation. And, uh, he was spending all his life listening to these, in fact, imaginary voices. And so the aim here was to stop him listening to the voices and to spend his time in more realistic occupations. 
So this, this angel warned him off, said, you, you have no business being in our world, you must stay in your own world. So this, this angel has quite a grim face. But over the course of a few sessions, the angel becomes helpful, and we changed her face, next please, to look rather more pleasant and smiling. It's very easy to do that with the software. Wow. Now the experimental design, we had to assess the value of this therapy, so we used a randomized control trial with a crossover of controls. So at the very beginning, the experimental patients received six weekly sessions, one a week, of avatar therapy, and then the therapy stopped, and after one more week, there was a follow-up. And the controls received their, their treatment as usual for the seven-week equivalent, and were then offered the experimental therapy. Uh, treatment as usual for almost all of them was long-term medication with antipsychotics. Um, but they also had regular meetings with their therapists for assessment. At the very beginning, though, when we first met the patients, we would do a, a baseline um, assessment. I'll, I'll show you what, what we measured in a little while. But um, we also spent quite a long time discussing with the patient what exactly the voice said. Now, mostly, these voices are quite um, repetitive. They, they say the same things again and again, very short phrases, always derogatory, often threatening, and um, very unpleasant for the patient to hear. So we start, well, I'll tell you what happens with that in a minute. The assessment instruments we used was the ba basic information on the age of the patient, their gender, level of education, whether they were employed. Only one of the 26 patients in the study actually had a job and he was self-employed. The hallucinations rating scale from that to well-established um, instrument. And then the belief about voices questionnaire, we took two scales, one for omnipotence, which is how powerful the, the voice is perceived, and one for malevolence, which is how evil the, the voice is. And then we used the Calgary Depression Scale for schizophrenia, which makes a, makes a differentiation between negative symptoms and uh, symptoms of schizophrenia. The assessments were carried out by a user researcher, that is, um, a man who himself had heard persecuted voices in the past, but had been free of them for eight years. And he, he was quite well, and he was trained to be researchers in many different studies, and he conducted all the follow-up assessments, and was blind not only to the treatment state, status of the participants, but also to the trial design. He didn't know it was a crossover. 26 participants were recruited from the community mental health teams in North London, where the study was based. 14 of those were randomized to therapy by chance, and 12 to treatment as usual. All the controls were successfully followed up for seven weeks. However, when the point came where they were offered the new the therapy, the avatar therapy, only eight of the 12 controls uh, accepted the therapy. Now, why did they not accept it? Well, several of them um, were warned off by their voices. Uh, one man heard his dead grandmother saying, if you start going with this therapy, you will go to hell. Another one, another man, um, whenever he tried to create his avatar, the devil gave him a pain in the groin. So these were opt-outs. Eight of the, six, eight of the, the 14 <coughs> experimentals completed the therapy, and there were high, unfortunately a high level of dropouts. The most common reason was multiple voices. We couldn't really <coughs> deal with multiple voices uh, in this system. And furthermore, the multiple voices, many for many of them, were so loud and so persistent that they couldn't concentrate on the avatar. So that was mainly the cause of the dropouts. So in total, eight controls and eight experimentals received the therapy, there's 16 in all, and all 16 were followed up for a further three months after the end of their therapy. There's some uh, data, data, basic data. The age range was very wide, from 14 to 74 years old, mean of nearly 40, uh, predominance of males, and the length of time of hearing voices ranged from three and a half years to more than 30 years, with a mode of more than 10 years.